Second part of chapter 8 of the first volume of The Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note. Its essential fidelity to the ideal. Plato, however, retained the moral and significant essence of his ideas, and while he made them ideal absolutes, fixed meanings antecedent to their changing expressions, never dreamed that they could be natural existences or psychological beings. In an original thinker, in one who really thinks and does not merely argue, to call a thing supernatural or spiritual or intelligible is to declare that it is no thing at all, no existence actual or possible, but a value, a term of thought, a merely ideal principle, and the more its reality in such a sense is insisted on, the more its incommensurability with brute existence is asserted. To express this ideal reality, myth is the natural vehicle, a vehicle Plato could avail himself of all the more freely that he inherited a religion still plastic and conscious of its poetic essence, and did not have to struggle like his modern disciples, with the asserted childishness of minds that for a hundred generations have learned their metaphysics in the cradle. His ideas, although their natural basis was ignored, were accordingly always ideal. They always represented meanings and functions and were never degraded from the moral to the physical sphere. The counterpart of this genuine ideality was that the theory retained its moral force and did not degenerate into a bewildered and idolatrous pantheism. Plato conceived the soul's destiny to be her emancipation from those material things which in this illogical apparition were so alien to her essence. She should return, after her baffling and stupefying intercourse with the world of sense and accident, into the native heaven of her ideas. For animal desires were no less illusory and yet no less significant than sensuous perceptions. They engaged man in the pursuit of the good and taught him, through disappointment, to look for it only in those satisfactions which can be permanent and perfect. Love, like intelligence, must rise from appearance to reality and rest in that divine world which is the fulfillment of the human. Side note, equal rights of empiricism. A geometrician does a good service when he declares and explicates the nature of the triangle, an object suggested by many causal and recurring sensations. His service is not less real, even if less obvious, when he arrests some fundamental concretion in discourse and formulates the first principles of logic. Mastering such definitions, sinking into the dry life of such forms, he may spin out and develop indefinitely in the freedom of his irresponsible logic, their implications and congruous extensions opening by his demonstration a depth of knowledge which we should otherwise never have discovered in ourselves. But if the geometer had a fanatical zeal and forbade us to consider space and the triangles it contains otherwise than as his own ideal science considers them, forbade us, for instance, to inquire how we came to perceive those triangles or that space, what organs and senses conspired in furnishing the idea of them, what material objects show that character, and how they came to offer themselves to our observation, then surely the geometer would qualify his service with a distinct injury, and while he opened our eyes to one fascinating vista, would tend to blind them to others no less tempting and beautiful. For the naturalist and psychologist have also their rights, and can tell us things well worth knowing. 
nor will any theory they will possibly propose concerning the origin of spatial ideas and their material embodiments ever invalidate the demonstrations of geometry these in their hypothetical sphere are perfectly autonomous and self-generating and their applicability to experience will hold so long as the initial images they are applied to continue to abound in perception if we awoke tomorrow in a world containing nothing but music geometry would indeed lose its relevance to our future experience but it would keep its ideal cogency and become again a living language if any spatial objects should ever reappear in sense the history of such reappearances natural history is meantime a good subject for observation and experiment chronicler and critic can always approach experience with a method complementary to the deductive methods pursued in mathematics and logic instead of developing the import of a definition he can investigate its origin and describe its relation to other disparate phenomena the mathematician develops the import of given ideas the psychologist investigates their origin and describes their relation to the rest of human experience so the prophet develops the import of his trance and the theologian the import of the prophecy which prevents not the historian from coming later and showing the origin the growth and the possible function of that maniacal sort of wisdom true the theologian commonly dreads a critic more than does the geometer but this happens only because the theologian has probably not developed the import of his facts with any authority or clearness but has distorted that ideal interpretation with all sorts of concessions and side glances at other tenets to which he is already pledged so that he justly fears when his methods are exposed that the religious heart will be alienated from him and his conclusions be left with no foothold in human nature if he had not been guilty of such misrepresentation no history or criticism that reviewed his construction would do anything but recommend it to all those who found in themselves the primary religious facts and religious faculties which that construction had faithfully interpreted in its ideal deductions and extensions all who perceive the facts would thus learn their import and theology would reveal to the soul her natural religion just as euclid reveals to architects and navigators the structure of natural space so that they value his demonstrations not only for their hypothetical cogency but for their practical relevance and truth side note logic dependent on fact for its importance now like the geometer and ingenuous theologian that he was plato developed the import of moral and logical experience even his followers though they might give rein to narrower and more fantastic enthusiasms often unveiled secrets hidden in the oracular intent of the heart which might never have been disclosed but for their lessons but with a zeal unbecoming so well-grounded a philosophy they turned their backs upon the rest of wisdom they disparaged the evidence of sense they grew hot against the ultimate practical sanctions furnished by impulse and pleasure they proscribed beauty in art where plato had prescribed chiefly what to a fine sensibility is meretricious ugliness and in a word they sought to abolish all human activities other than the one preeminent in themselves in revenge for their hostility the great world has never given them more than a distrustful admiration and confronted daily by the evident truth they denied has encouraged itself to forget the truth they asserted for they had the bias of reflection and man is born to do more than reflect 
they attributed reality and validity only to logical ideas, and man finds other objects continually thrusting themselves before his eyes, claiming his affection and controlling his fortunes. The most legitimate constructions of reason soon become merely speculative, soon pass, I mean, beyond the sphere of practical application, and the man of affairs, adjusting himself at every turn to the opaque brutality of fact, loses his respect for the higher reaches of logic and forgets that his recognition of facts themselves is an application of logical principles. In his youth, perhaps, he pursued metaphysics, which are the love affairs of the understanding. Now he is wedded to convention and seeks in the passion he calls business, or in the habit he calls duty, some substitute for natural happiness. He fears to question the value of his life, having found that such questioning adds nothing to his powers, and he thinks the mariner would die of old age in port who would wait for reason to justify his voyage. Reason is indeed like the sad Iphigenia whom her royal father, the will, must sacrifice before any wind can fill his sails. The emanation of all things from the one involves not only the incarnation but the crucifixion of the Logos. Reason must be eclipsed by its supposed expressions and can only shine in a darkness which does not comprehend it. For reason is essentially hypothetical and subsidiary and can never constitute what it expresses in man nor what it recognizes in nature. Side note and for its subsistence. If logic should refuse to make this initial self-sacrifice and to subordinate itself to impulse and fact, it would immediately become irrational and forfeit its own justification, for it exists by virtue of a human impulse and in answer to a human need. To ask a man, in the satisfaction of a metaphysical passion, to forego every other good is to render him fanatical and to shut his eyes daily to the sun in order that he may see better by the starlight. The radical fault of rationalism is not any incidental error committed in its deductions, although such necessarily abound in every human system. Its great original sin is its denial of its own basis and its refusal to occupy its due place in the world, an ignorant fear of being invalidated by its history and dishonored, as it were, if its ancestry is hinted at. Only bastards should fear that fate, and criticism would indeed be fatal to a bastard philosophy to one that does not spring from practical reason and has no roots in life. But those products of reason which arise by reflection on fact, and those spontaneous and demonstrable systems of ideas which can be verified in experience, and thus serve to render the facts calculable and articulate, will lose nothing of their lustre by discovering their lineage. So the idea of nature remains true after psychology has analyzed its origin, and not only true, but beautiful and beneficent. For unlike many negligible products of speculative fancy, it is woven out of recurrent perceptions into a hypothetical cause from which further perceptions can be deduced as they are actually experienced. Such a mechanism, once discovered, confirms itself at every breath we draw and surrounds every object in history and nature with infinite and true suggestions, making it doubly interesting, fruitful and potent over the mind. The naturalist accordingly welcomes criticism because his constructions, though no less hypothetical and speculative than the idealist dreams, are such legitimate and fruitful fictions that they are obvious truths. For truth, at the intelligible level where it arises, 
means not sensible fact but valid ideation, verified hypothesis and inevitable stable inference. If the idealist fears and deprecates any theory of his own origin and function, he is only obeying the instinct of self-preservation, for he knows very well that his past will not bear examination. He is heir to every superstition and by profession an apologist. His deepest vocation is to rescue by some logical toward the force what spontaneously he himself would have taken for a consecrated error. Now history and criticism would involve, as he instinctively perceives, the reduction of his doctrines to their pragmatic value, to their ideal significance for real life. But he detests any admission of relativity in his doctrines, all the more because he cannot avow his reasons for detesting it, and zeal, here as in so many cases, becomes the cover and evidence of a bad conscience. Bigotry and craft, with a rhetorical vilification of enemies, then come to reinforce in the prophet that natural limitation of his interests which turns his face away from history and criticism until his system in its monstrous unreality and disingenuousness becomes intolerable and provokes a general revolt in which too often the truth of it is buried with the error in a common oblivion side note reason and docility if idealism is entrenched in the very structure of human reason empiricism represents all those energies of the external universe which as spinoza said must infinitely exceed the energies of man if meditation breeds science wisdom comes by dissolution even on the subject of science itself docility to the facts makes the sanity of science reason is only half grown and not really distinguishable from imagination so long as she cannot check and recast her own processes wherever they render the moulds of thought unfit for their subject matter docility is as we have seen the deepest condition of reason's existence for if a form of mental synthesis were by chance developed which was incapable of appropriating the data of sense, these data could not be remembered or introduced at all into a growing and cumulative experience. Sensations would leave no memorial, while logical thoughts would play idly like so many parasites in the mind and ultimately languish and die of inanition. To be nourished and employed, intelligence must have developed such structure and habits as will enable it to assimilate what food comes in its way, so that the persistence of any intellectual habit is a proof that it has some applicability, however partial, to the facts of sentience. Side note. Applicable thought and clarified experience. This applicability, the prerequisite of significant thought, is also its eventual test, and the gathering of new experiences, the consciousness of more and more facts crowding into the memory and demanding coordination, is at once the presentation to reason of her legitimate problem and a proof that she is already at work. It is a presentation of her problem, because reason is not a faculty of dreams but a method in living and by facing the flux of sensations and impulses that constitute mortal life with the gift of ideal construction and the aspiration toward eternal goods she is only doing her duty and manifesting what she is to accumulate facts moreover is in itself to prove that rational activity is already awakened because a consciousness of multitudinous accident diversifying experience involves a wide scope in memory good methods of classification and keen senses so that all working together they may collect many observations 
memory and all its instruments are embodiments on a modest scale or rational activities which in theory and speculation reappear upon a higher level the expansion of the mind in point of retentiveness and wealth of images is as much an advance in knowledge as is its development in point of organization the structure may be widened at the base as well as raised toward its ideal summit and while a mass of information imperfectly digested leaves something still for intelligence to do it shows at the same time how much intelligence has done already the function of reason is to dominate experience and obviously openness to new impressions is no less necessary to that end than is the possession of principles by which new impressions may be interpreted end of chapter eight